Hello, this is Dr. Sai Praveen Harnath from Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. Thank you so much to the Critic team for inviting me to give this very interesting talk on artificial intelligence and critical care. I really appreciate you calling me because I was able to learn so much just trying to prepare for this talk. This is a area that most of us should become familiar with because we need to make sense of the technology and the terminology. And I'll give you an overview of the trends which are coming down the line. Now, when you look at artificial intelligence, some people have had these funny t-shirts that say artificial intelligence is better than natural stupidity. That's just a joke. But honestly speaking, if you are actually programming a computer to take care of a human life, we really need to pay a lot of attention to it. Now, if you look at the entire spectrum, by the way, I have no disclosures for this talk. Now, if you look at the entire spectrum of research on artificial intelligence, now there's over 140,000 studies since the you know, last few years, and they've been increasing every year. And if you look at PubMed, specifically for artificial intelligence and critical care medicine, there's over 1,800 research studies already just on that specific topic. And my talk is taken from several resources, including some very nice review articles, uh, which have come out in the literature in the recent past. Now, what is AI really? Is it truly artificial? Around us every day, you've been using AI and you may or may not know it. If you order from Swiggy, you're probably using AI. If you're trying to order something from Amazon, you're having a chat discussion, it's probably an artificial intelligence chatbot. If you had an automatic car from Tesla, for example, they're driving on their own. Now, Google Maps has AI technology. And of course, when you're typing into, a, say, a search engine like Google, or even just typing regular notes, even on WhatsApp, for example, you have autocorrect. And these are all forms of AI. And according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, AI refers to a system endowed with the intellectual processes characteristic of humans, such as the ability to reason, discover, meaning, generalize, or learn from past experience. And as human beings, we have evolved over several millions of years in terms of getting to this place. And we are trying to jumpstart technology to mimic how we actually behave and think. And many people have actually been very successful. We are not very far from the point of time when we can actually mimic human intelligence. If you compared an artificial intelligence computer and a human computer and the human brain, we actually use more energy. We use about 26 watts of energy and a computer probably uses about two watts of energy. So you're actually looking at a situation where AI might be more energy efficient than the human brain. Now, you might have even heard of a topic called ML or machine learning. Now, machine learning essentially is a subset of artificial intelligence and it can be what is called supervised or unsupervised. Now, the unsupervised part is the realm of more interesting research where you give a huge amount of data to a computer and say, figure something out. It's almost like you have a painting to a computer and say, do you make any sense of all the brush strokes that you're seeing, the colors that you're seeing? And in the unsupervised model, you might come up with certain anomalies. In other words, the computer analyzes the data and says, you know, everything is fitting, but this little one quirk is there that doesn't make sense. And a lot of discoveries happen because of detecting anomalies. You can also figure out we are clustering the data, meaning you organize the data, which looks very random, but the machine says there are many ways to organize and clusters it. In supervised machine learning, you can do the standard usual statistics, which we are used to, which is called regression analysis, which can be a linear regression or multiple regression, where you analyze the data based on certain criteria that you already set. You can also classify the data in a supervised AI ML set subset where you use these different kinds of statistical processes. Some of them can be neural networks. Some of them can be what are called gradient boosted. You can also have decision trees. These are just multiple terms. Let's not go into the details of that. But the overall big picture view is that you can categorize data based on criteria that you give the computer. Now, how do AI systems learn? It's through pattern recognition, just like children. You look at a flower and you look at the next flower and you know that, you know what, that's probably a flower. In fact, recently there was an interesting experiment where they gave a whole set of photographs about a person to a computer. They made the computer learn the pictures and they said, generate a future picture from these old pictures. And the computer actually did that. And the AI algorithm came up with an image which didn't sometimes look human, but often it looked like another person. And many paintings have been made using AI. Likewise, AI is not just a simple computer program which uses if then else, meaning if this condition is met, you do this. If this condition is not met, you do something else. 
and AI systems can learn and evolve. They can actually program themselves. In fact, there are now computer programs which write computer programs where you don't need a human interface and that is where things are moving ahead. Now in healthcare, how does it help us? Now this is such an important area that the FDA of the US has actually come out with something called the AI ML, artificial intelligence, machine learning based software as a medical device action plan. They came out with a pretty large data, like a whole large document, which actually talks about what are the risks and the benefits and how can we do this? The reality is that augmented intelligence is a more available solution. In other words, you're trying to diagnose a condition say a critically ill patient with, who can have multiple differential diagnosis, the augmented intelligence kind of tells you, doctor, why don't you think about these things? This patient came in with weakness on one side, his blood pressure is high, he has a family history of strokes, maybe he has a bleed in the head. And those kinds of things might be the reality that we are facing in the very near future. When you're entering data into an electronic record, you might get predictive entries, just like a search engine on Google suggests some things for you to do, you might get that. Likewise, you can detect anomalies or patterns, which we mentioned earlier. We have several made in India examples, which I'll get to very shortly. You can get clinical decision support where you're trying to make a decision for a patient with say kidney failure on dosing the antibiotic and the AI engine might come in and say, hey doc, this patient has kidney failure because of NSAIDs. This creatinine might improve in so many days. Why don't we dose them right now with this particular dose? You might also get new insights from data and devices. You might get insights from various monitoring devices and continuous monitoring might move not just in the hospital, it may move to the home and the emergency space that all of the data can get integrated. And if you look at the thing about data, garbage in, garbage out. In other words, if you don't put the correct data in, you'll end up with all kinds of nonsense. And that has also been seen in the AI uh, sphere. You have to define something called the feature matrix in the class vector. These are terms you'll come across when you're reading about AI and ML, where you take the data and say, these are the features I want to analyze about this particular data. It might be something like height, weight, Apache score, so far. It might be something about the lactic acid, for example. Then you take a database and then you split it randomly and you let the machine train on 80% of the data. You train the algorithm saying, evaluate this for patterns. After that, you test the remaining 20% of data using the patterns that the machine came up with. And this is not like A plus B is equal to C. It might be A plus B equal to C to the power 10 minus 8, whatever. So the machine comes up with its own equation. And then you test that model in another population and you evaluate its accuracy. So you train the model, test the model, and then you evaluate the model. Now, what is deep learning? So the human brain, as you know, is made up of you know, trillions of neurons. And the basic element of the neural network is called the perceptron. And the similar terminology is used when you're doing a computer-based neural network, where multiple inputs are given a certain weight, importance of prioritization. It ultimately ends up in what's called the net input function. And then you activate it and you get an output. Now, the same thing happens in a neural network, which happens in the brain. And you can interact many networks to kind of come up with a solution. And machine learning using advanced supercomputers, for example, can have multiple layers of neural networks. And that is called deep learning. And this is what I call the internet of the brain. Now, there have been some studies using MI and ML and AI, and some of them include very useful ones, including something called a hypotension prediction index. Now, this study, which used MIMIC2 data, MIMIC2 data, by the way, is a large uh, critical care database, which many people can access, and you can do research on the data. And what you do is you put the data in, do the training, do the validation, and then you do external validation, which we talked about. And in this study, they actually looked at hypotension prediction based on the arterial line waveform. In this graph, the ROC curve, sensitivity to the one minus specificity in this particular study, what they did was, you see the red line right at the towards the one. That is when the event of the low blood pressure happened. After that, they said, can I detect this earlier than it happens? And they were actually able to do it. So they had 255 patients. They had almost 300,000 data points. The monitoring time was about four hours or so. And subsequently, what they did was they were able to actually Look at the, uh, the number of patients who are there. They actually checked the definition of hypotension and they were able to look at the map and called it you know, less than 65 for more than a minute. That is supposed to be hypotension. And at less than three minutes, they got a pretty decent curve where you can see that at five minutes, 
the HPI in the green line is approaching one. So five minutes before somebody's blood pressure drops, you can actually detect it. Another study looked at the similar waveform analysis, and you can see the arterial waveform there. And what I mentioned earlier, the various features, you can look at the features of the signal features, the device features, the complexity features, and you can actually look at the change features. Essentially, mathematically, you can kind of analyze the data and split it any way you want, and then you end up with a solution which may end up in a final predictive model. Now, we all know about the patient is struggling story. Now, obviously, don't just go paralyze them. Go look at the waveform on the ventilator. And now they actually have ways to do that. AI can read the waveform for you. There's plenty of research in this area. There's some companies to actually come out with commercial solutions. One of them, for example, is a better care system where they talked about comparing an AI-based and an expert-based system to detect the inadequate exhalation or the inefficient exhalation and inefficient breathing. They come up with an asynchrony index, which tells you if, if this patient is actually not doing well, it can alert you. Now, in a pandemic situation where you have, say, 20, 30, 40 patients on ventilators, all with ARDS, if you had a assistance of a device like this, which tells you, hey, bed number 18 and bed number 12, you need to go and see right now because the asynchrony index is going high. That's one quick way to do it. And you can even do this remotely using tele-intensive care, for example. Now, there are many made in India projects. Now, there are some in sepsis. In my own hospital, I've been a co-author for a study where we looked at a COVID-19 uh, mortality prediction using AI. We also have many studies published, just some pictures that you can see on organ failure detection. There are many emerging areas of research using uh, AI and ML, and these include predicting hemodynamic shock in, in, in neonates using thermal imaging and machine learning. There's also a study of using handheld ultrasound device using AI to evaluate cardiorespiratory system. So a lot of things are going on. And in fact, people are combining other areas, including pathology, including radiology, to come up with a composite solution. Because ultimately, what's our goal? Can we make the patient get better, go home faster? So in the ICU, you're always asking the question, is the diagnosis correct? Is the vital sign parameters change? Is that something that I can actually take care of right away? Or do I need to make a change? And can the patient be discharged out of the ICU? Can I extubate the patient? These are the common questions we ask. And in our own model, for example, what we did was we looked at the various lab and clinical parameters. We looked at old records. We looked at discharge records. We came up with a set of parameters we wanted to analyze. We used this something called the boosting, gradient boosting algorithm, which I mentioned to you earlier. And ultimately, we tested it, and we're using it right now. We're trying to see if we can expand using other kinds of data, including, say, for example, cough analysis. Now, this is a picture that is called a violin plot. It looks like those, uh, you know, those uh, underwater creatures which swim along like the stingrays. And this essentially shows you the pattern that will analyze whether this patient's data point which we're using is accurate or not. So we've looked at things like the SpO2, the CRP. As the numbers head towards the top, it is generally supposed to be a better index of survival. And this is another similar way of a Kaplan-Meier graph, which is explaining the same thing in a little different way, in a more familiar way for us. Now, there's been some very good experts talking about AI, and one of them said in the data-intensive environment of today's ICUs, however, intensivists must cope with a relentless flow of information. Some of it useful, most of it is not. In fact, there's about 236 data points you're analyzing for each patient, and some of it is unconscious. And a machine must try to overcome the biases that you input into it. So if you were to put data in, which is not accurate, that can be a problem. Now, Moore's law is a law you might have heard about. It talks about the number of transistors on a microchip, and it says that it doubles every two years. If you look at this curve, it's a kind of a reduced curve using some kind of a, a statistical analysis to make it look like a straight line. But your phone right now, for example, if you have an Apple phone or an Android phone, is immensely more powerful. They have like 10 billion transistors on that tiny chip compared to what was there even just 15 years ago was hardly anything. So when you have a computing power like this, AI can do a lot of things. And in fact, the Apple phones have an AI chip inside them, which are always doing things. And when you take a picture with an Apple phone, for example, they use artificial intelligence to balance out the colors as well as the light exposure. Likewise, in critical care, we have plenty of new things like I showed you earlier. Now, what is the future? You mean like tomorrow? The tomorrow is already here. And you need to talk about what's called explainable AI. Explainable AI is where you need to understand why the machine told you something is right. 
Now, if you look at heart rate variability and mortality, there's a very good correlation, but we really don't know exactly why that happens. There's going to be continuous device integration using smartwatches as well as wearable devices. You need to combine reliability and accuracy. Both of these points need to come together. Now, cars and patients will crash. In other words, cars have accidents. However, if you look at the data analysis, AI-based automated cars are double the time safer than our own safest drivers. In fact, the safest drivers in the world are in, Nor in, in Norway, and the AI machines are twice as safe as them. You do get early warning indices from sepsis alerts. I've seen situations where there's a sepsis alert that a machine gives you. I've also seen radiology devices where the AI has analyzed an endotracheal tube in a very busy x-ray and showed you the distance in the carina, and it also has a normal x-ray, but the doctor can also read it. And as we talked about earlier, differential diagnosis as well as safe medication practices can be practiced using AI where you can adjust your treatment. So is it all worth it? Of course, AI has become another member of your team. It's just another member of your team as written in this article in the Lancet, which just agree that there is promise in the ICU. Now, one area we need to remember is our training data set should not have bias. In fact, if you look at the United States, for example, black patients get antibiotics much longer for the first antibiotic dose than white patients. And part of it is maybe because of the training data is based on a lot of the research is based on a certain population group. Likewise, there needs to be regulation on AI so that things are done safely. You do need universal access. You know, you can't restrict AI only to people who can afford it. And ultimately, the question is, can we trust AI? There's been plenty of science fiction movies talking about how AI can take over. But honestly, in healthcare, given the amount of regulation, given the speed at which things are moving and should move, there is a very hopeful future for all of us to take care of patients better. I don't like to close my talks without giving us some context as to where we are. Now, this is a composite from NASA's electric uh, night image of all the lights in the world. And if you see that, not every place is lighted up. And the important thing, of course, some of these are forests and we don't have light there, but you can clearly see that there's a big divide between places with electricity places without electricity. Likewise, you do need you know, electric power to run these machines. And we really need more equity in the world in terms of just critical care access, critical care availability, and of course, ultimately availability of artificial intelligence. Never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And that would be the lesson I would give an AI machine and tell them, keep learning. Thank you again to the critic team for this wonderful opportunity to talk about AI. And I think we are at the cusp of a very bright horizon. And again, enjoy the conference. Thank you so much.